Tired of getting confused about G prime, E prime, and 10 delta? Well, you're not the only one. And today I'm going to help you understand the meaning of these real logical measurements. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Ascetic Minutes. Today we're reviewing a topic that many clinicians may find challenging, rheology. Rheology is incredibly pertinent to aesthetic medicine because it helps us model the behavior of hyaluronic acid fillers. Rheology comes from the Greek rheo, meaning flow, and logia, meaning the study of, and is the discipline tasked with understanding how fluids flow and solids deform. Rheology has been key to our understanding the properties and behavior of viscoelastic solids, like gels. But what does it mean when we say a material is viscoelastic? In order to understand this, we have to go all the way back to basic chemistry. In the universe, matter can exist in any one of four fundamental states, solid, liquid, gas, or plasma, which is an ionized gas. Solids can be defined as materials having both fixed volume and shape, liquids as having fixed volume but no shape, and gases and plasma as having neither a fixed volume nor shape. Gases, liquids, and plasma are also known as fluids because they naturally flow easily in response to minimal disturbances. So for simplicity and discussing basic rheology, we'll just divide matter into solids and fluids. The behavior of solids and fluids differs quite significantly from a rheological standpoint. For starters, solids are able to maintain their shape, while fluids by definition have no shape at all. The ability of a material to maintain a physical shape is known as rigidity, and thus solids are said to be rigid, while fluids are non-rigid and instead have the ability to flow. In rheology, for most solids, the property of rigidity is a measure of the elasticity of a material, which can be defined as the intrinsic ability of a material to resist deformation. The degree to which a material can resist deformation is defined by Hooke's law, which states that the elastic strength of a material, a measure known as the elastic modulus, is equal to the ratio of the stress that must be applied to a material over the strain that is induced in that material. The concepts of stress and strain are intuitive, but they carry an objective meaning that's very important to understand. In rheology, stress can be thought of as the internal pressure that a material is subjected to when external forces are applied. For example, if a solid square object is exposed to an external compressive force, as it's squeezed, the molecules within that solid are pushed together until their repulsion offsets the external compression. The internal pressure that builds from such repulsive energy is what we call stress, and the relative deformation that has occurred by the time this repulsive force offsets the external compression is known as a strain. Strain is simply a measure of how much an object's dimensions have changed. In this case, it's defined as the ratio of the solid's height after compression to what it measured before compression. Because stress is a pressure, it carries the units of pascals, while strain being a ratio of two different measurements has no units. For simplicity, we can think of stress as the force applied to an object, while the strain is a deformation that occurs in response to that stress. Because the modulus of elasticity is equal to the ratio of stress and strain, it also has the units of pressure, or pascals. The higher the elastic modulus, the stronger the material will be. For example, steel has a higher elastic modulus than aluminum, and thus steel has a greater resistance to deformation than aluminum because it can tolerate nearly three times as much stress before it strains or deforms. Now, as it turns out, there are three different types of stress, each with its own modulus of elasticity. This is because of the different ways in which forces can act upon an object. By definition, a stress arises when two opposing forces act upon a material. Depending on how the forces are positioned relative to each other, one of three types of stress can occur. Normal stress, shear stress, and volumetric stress. The first type of stress, normal stress, pertains to an object that is either being compressed or stretched by two forces pushing or pulling on it from opposite ends simultaneously. Normal stress occurs when the forces acting upon the object are aligned, such that they are directly opposite each other in the same plane. The second type of stress, shear stress, occurs when two forces are not aligned, such that it causes molecules to slide past each other, resulting in a shearing deformity or strain. Unlike a normal force, a shear force is parallel to the reference plane that it's acting upon, and the resultant shear strain causes the object to change shape due to a change in its angles without a change in its dimensions. The third type of stress, volumetric stress, can be thought of as the three-dimensional version of normal stress, wherein the object is either stretched or squeezed in all directions equally. 
because there are three different types of stress that can be imposed upon an object, there are also three different types of elastic modulus. Thus, we have the elastic modulus represented by uppercase E for a normal stress, the shear elastic modulus represented by uppercase G for a shear stress, and the bulk elastic modulus for volumetric stress represented by uppercase K. E is equal to the ratio of the normal stress to its resultant normal strain. E reflects the tensile or compressive elastic strength of a material, with a higher value of E representing a material that is less compressible and less stretchy. The second modulus is the modulus of shear elasticity G. G is equal to the shear stress over the shear strain. Just like E, G also reflects the elastic strength of a solid material, but in terms of shear deformability, with a higher G correlating with a stronger material that is less moldable. The third modulus is the modulus of volumetric elasticity, known as the bulk modulus K, and it reflects a stress-strain relationship with regard to volume changes. The bulk modulus is not relevant for this talk because it does not significantly contribute to the behavior of hyaluronic acid fillers in tissues. Thus, the elastic modulus E and the shear elastic modulus G will be the quantities we'll focus on. Now, one may ask, we have discussed these moduli of elasticity as applied to solids, but how do they apply to fluids? As it turns out, these moduli are not useful for describing the behavior of fluids because, as already described, fluids possess no shape, and we cannot measure resistance to deformation in materials that are, by definition, shapeless. So in fluids, the value of E and G is essentially zero. In other words, fluids have a zero modulus of elasticity because they're unable to resist deformation. But this is what makes a fluid act like a fluid. Elasticity is therefore largely a property of solids, but fluids have their own intrinsic rheological property, that of viscosity. Viscosity is what helps us explain the rheological properties and behaviors of fluids. Just like solids are characterized by the property of elasticity, which is described as the ability of a solid to resist deformation, fluids are characterized by viscosity, which is defined as the ability of a fluid to resist flow. The viscosity of a fluid is described by Newton's law of viscosity, where viscosity is calculated as the ratio of shear stress to the shear strain rate, and it has the units of Pascal second. The shear strain rate describes the rate of shearing of a fluid. In other words, it describes how quickly a fluid is flowing. Thus, viscosity is a measure of how much pressure must be applied to a fluid in order to make it flow at a specific rate. This means that, all else being equal, a fluid with low viscosity, like water, flows much more easily than high viscosity fluids, like honey. If you pour water and honey into separate containers, you'll see that water flows more rapidly to spread across the container compared to the honey. Some fluids, like water and vinegar, are simple and predictable, having a constant viscosity regardless of conditions, and are known as Newtonian fluids. Other fluids, however, like molasses, are not as predictable because their viscosity varies with the rate of flow. They are known as non-Newtonian fluids. Hyaluronic acid fillers, being gels, are also non-Newtonian in their behavior. But in order to understand why this is relevant, we must first define what a gel is. And in order to do so, we have to go back to basic chemistry once again. Although matter can exist as solid and fluid states, we can combine materials in different states and create a mixture that will have properties that are different than its components. In chemistry, we call a mixture of two different materials a dispersion. Dispersions are characterized by a dispersed medium and a dispersed phase. Dispersions in which the dispersed particles are very small, less than one nanometer, are known as solutions, with the most common example being salt water. In a solution, the dispersion medium, or the water, is called the solvent, and the dispersed phase, or the salt, is called the solute. Solutions are homogeneous, and they look completely transparent on transillumination. And even though they are a mixture of a liquid and a solid, they behave as only one phase, or liquid. On the other hand, dispersions in which the dispersed particles are very large, greater than one micrometer, are known as suspensions, with the most common example being sand mixed in water. Unlike solutions, suspensions have particles so large that they separate from the mixture just by gravity alone, through sedimentation. Suspensions are heterogeneous, with two visibly separate phases, and they look opaque or cloudy on transillumination because the solid particles scatter light. However, if the dispersed particles in a mixture are between 1 nanometer and 1 micrometer, then the size is just right for a colloid. Colloids are dispersions in which the dispersed particles are large enough to form a heterogeneous mixture that can scatter light, but that are too small to precipitate out of the mixture. 
Colloids are defined by the state of their dispersion medium and dispersed phase, and there are several different possible combinations. For example, colloids formed by two liquids are known as emulsions, with milk being a prime example. In contrast, colloids in which a gas is dispersed in a liquid are known as foams, such as shaving cream. However, if a liquid is dispersed into a solid, then the resulting mixture is known as a gel, and if that liquid is water, then the colloid is known as a hydrogel. Hyaluronic acid fillers are all hydrogels. Hyaluronic acid fillers, being gels, exist as a mixture of a liquid phase within a solid phase. As a result, they demonstrate both the properties of viscosity and elasticity and are known as viscoelastic materials. Viscoelastic materials do not obey Newton's law of viscosity because their viscosity is not constant. Rather, gels behave as non-Newtonian fluids and can show a dramatic change in viscosity when the shear strain rate is increased. This feature of viscoelastic materials results in fascinating phenomena that can only be seen in these complex mixtures. For example, some colloid mixtures show an increase in viscosity with an increased rate of shearing, a property known as shear thickening. A great example of a shear thickening colloid is a mixture of cornstarch and water called oobleck. At rest, oobleck behaves like a liquid because its viscosity is low when little movement is occurring. However, if a sudden increase in pressure is applied by squeezing oobleck, the viscosity of the colloid increases significantly. The result is a solution that flows easily like a fluid at rest, but suddenly hardens and behaves like a solid when increased pressure is applied. In other words, it can act both like a solid and a liquid under the right circumstances. Substances like oobleck that show an instantaneous increase in viscosity with an increase in shear strain rate are known as dilatants. Other mixtures, like whipping cream, only show a shear thickening gradually over time and they're instead known as rheopectic. In contrast, some colloid mixtures show a decrease in viscosity with an increased rate of shearing, a property known as shear thinning or pseudoplastic behavior. If you've ever struggled to get ketchup out of an old-fashioned glass bottle, then you've witnessed shear thinning behavior in a colloid firsthand. At rest, ketchup has a high viscosity, so simply inverting the bottle does not cause it to flow. However, tapping on the bottle induces a sudden increase in the rate of shear strain, which causes the ketchup to become less viscous and thus flow. Toothpaste is another example of a shear thinning colloid. Some other shear thinning fluids, like wall paint, take time to thin out via prolonged mixing, and they are called fixotropic. Hyaluronic acid hydrogels are examples of shear thinning colloids, and this pseudoplastic behavior is extremely important clinically. At rest in the syringe, the hyaluronic acid gel looks and behaves more like a solid. However, once exposed to the high stress and shearing rates during extrusion through a small needle or cannula, the viscosity of the hyaluronic acid fillers decreases dramatically, allowing them to flow out smoothly. The pressure at which this occurs is known as the yield stress, and above it, the gel behaves more like a fluid. Once settled in the tissues, however, due to the low shear rates of human soft tissues, it once again behaves more like a solid, displaying significant elasticity and resistance to deformation. So this dual ability of gels to act like solids in one setting and fluids in another can be harnessed clinically to make fillers that are thicker or thinner depending on their intended use. It's thus very important for us to be able to describe how much like a solid versus a fluid a hyaluronic acid gel will act. We can do this by measuring how much a viscoelastic material will store versus dissipate energy. If we think about it, the solid-like property of elasticity can be viewed as the ability of a material to store energy. The best example of this is a spring. If a weight is suspended from a tethered spring, the spring will immediately extend or strain, converting the weight of the object or its potential energy into potential elastic energy. The stronger the spring, the higher its elastic modulus, and the heavier the object must be in order to distend the spring maximally. Upon removal of the weight, the stored elastic energy in the spring will allow it to immediately return to its original length. Hence, the elastic strain is recoverable because the spring was able to store the energy necessary for it to return to its baseline position. The property of elasticity of a solid can thus be thought of as the ability to store energy. On the other hand, if the weight is instead suspended from a dash pot or damper filled with water, the weight of the object will also extend the dash pot all the way down, but it will do it slowly compared to the spring because the viscosity of the liquid slows things down. If the water in the dash pot is switched with a higher viscosity fluid, like honey, then it will take a larger weight to extend the dash pot at the same rate as it did with water. Once you remove the weight, the dash pot will still remain down. In other words, the viscous strain is irrecoverable. 
the potential energy of the weight has thus been dissipated by the dash pot fluid via the internal friction between its molecules. The property of viscosity is therefore the ability of a fluid to dissipate or lose energy. Now because gels combine a liquid and solid phase and are viscoelastic, they can be described by a combination of the spring and dash pot models. In other words, they can be described as materials that can store some energy and dissipate some energy. The model that best describes this viscoelastic behavior is Berger's model, which combines springs and dash pots to predict the behavior of viscoelastic substances. In such a model, suspending a weight onto the structure would cause the object's weight or potential energy to distend the structure maximally more slowly because of the damping effect of the dash pots. Once the weight is removed, the structure will slowly try to return to its original configuration due to the action of the springs. However, because of the energy dissipated by the dash pots, some of the strain is irrecoverable and the structure will not return to its baseline position. It is thus partially deformed permanently. So the modulus of elasticity for a viscoelastic material must therefore be able to take into account the elastic energy storing component and the viscous energy dissipating component of a viscoelastic material in order to help us predict the behavior of hyaluronic acid gels. This is achieved through the calculation of what is known as the complex modulus, represented by E star for normal stresses and G star for shearing stresses. The complex modulus of elasticity is equal to the Pythagorean sum of the elastic component called the storage modulus, represented by E prime and G prime, and the viscous component, also called the loss modulus, represented by E double prime and G double prime, such that we have the complex modulus E star for normal stresses equal to E prime plus E double prime, and the shear complex modulus G star equal to G prime and G double prime. The complex storage and loss moduli can all be easily measured with a device known as a rheometer. A rheometer delivers a known stress to a sample of gel and measures the resultant strain. The storage and loss moduli are extremely helpful in characterizing the behavior of hyaluronic acid gels. For example, a hyaluronic acid gel with a high shear storage modulus G prime and a low shear loss modulus G double prime will behave more like a solid than a fluid and when exposed to temporary shear stresses, the gel is likely to recover fully with minimal deformation. Conversely, if the G prime is low and the G double prime is high, the gel is more likely to irreversibly deform easily but flow smoothly. An even more useful way to describe the viscoelasticity of a gel is through the ratio of G double prime to G prime. This ratio is known as tan delta because of how these rheological measurements are governed by the Pythagorean theorem. The relationship between the complex modulus and the storage and loss moduli is that of the relationship between the three sides of a right triangle, with the complex modulus being the hypotenuse. As a result, it naturally follows from the theorem that the tangent of the angle delta is equal to the ratio of the opposite side over the adjacent side, or G double prime over G prime, hence why this ratio is called tan delta. The tan delta is a quick way to identify the overall behavior of a gel. If the tan delta is less than 1, then the material is more elastic than viscous, acting more like a block of gelatin. If the tan delta is greater than 1, then the material is more viscous than elastic, acting more like honey. Since fillers are gels with more solid than fluid behaviors, their tan delta values are usually all less than 1, with thicker fillers having a lower tan delta than thin fillers. Although not yet established, the tan delta value may also prove to be useful in predicting the cohesivity of a gel. The cohesivity of a gel is defined as the ability of the gel to deform without breaking, or its sheer malleability. Materials with a higher tan delta behave like warm butter spread on toast. They dissipate energy more readily because they are more viscous and they therefore deform more easily, gliding or flowing along a surface. This deformability means that they can tolerate a greater amount of shearing stress without breaking. On the other hand, fillers with a low tan delta are more rigid, behaving more like refrigerated butter on toast, fragmenting more easily due to shearing. The cohesivity of a gel appears to be important in the biointegration of fillers, allowing materials to smoothly adapt to the nooks and crannies of biological tissues. Very soft fillers like Bellatero, due to low G prime, high G double prime, and high tan delta values, are highly cohesive compared to more rigid fillers like Resilin Lift. Bellatero is thus better suited for superficial injection, while Resilin Lift is better suited for a deeper injection. 
Now you may be wondering, how come we use the values of G prime and G double prime so often in describing the behavior of hyaluronic acid fillers, but rarely ever hear about E prime and E double prime? In reality, the compressive storage in loss moduli E prime and E double prime do appear to play a useful role in describing some in vitro differences between fillers of different brands, and they have begun to be employed by rheologists to further make sense of the ever growing number and variety of fillers that we have today. However, within the soft tissue framework of the face, the shearing properties of fillers G prime and G double prime appear to be much more relevant to the behavior of fillers due to the high shearing stresses that are characteristic of facial expression. In addition, because all fillers will have a much higher resistance to compression or E prime in the relatively soft environment of the facial soft tissues, the normal elastic moduli of E prime and E double prime don't appear to be as valuable in explaining the behavior of fillers in vivo. Now that we have discussed the basic rheology of hyaluronic acid fillers, it's time to put these concepts to work and review the differences between the different brands of hyaluronic acid fillers. To find out about this, tune in next time to our next episode of Aesthetic Minutes. Thank you for watching.